Hi. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good morning to everyone. Welcome to U2M Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series number 113. My name is uh, Dr. Zaki Yamani bin Zakaria and I'm from Faculty of Engineering, Center for Engineering Education, U University of Technology Malaysia, UTM. Uh, it's 10 a.m. here and it's uh, another hour at the other part of the world. Okay, welcome again to this uh, DLS 113. We are very, very honored and happy to have a very distinguished speaker who is actually an expert in engineering, learning and teaching. She's none other than Professor Cynthia J. Ekman. Okay, but before we proceed further, I would like to intro I would like to invite our Dean, Professor Dato I. R. Rafik, uh, okay, to uh, to briefly introduce Prof. Cynthia. Over to you, Dato. Uh, thank you, Zaki. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone to our 113th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Cynthia Edman from University of Washington, USA. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Cynthia Edman is the founding director of the Center for Engineering Learning and Teaching, CELT, a professor in human-centered design and engineering, and the inaugural holder of the Mitchell T. and Lela Blanche Bowie Endowed Chair at the University of Washington. Dr. Edmund is co-director of the Consortium to Promote Reflection in Engineering Education, CPREE, funded by the Leona M. and Harry B. Helmsley Charitable Trust. She was director of the NSF-funded Center for the Advancement of Engineering Education, CAEE, a national research center that was funded from 2003 to 2010. Her research focuses on engineering design learning, considering context in engineering design and the use of reflection to support learning. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and the ASEE. Dr. Edmund holds a PhD in engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Cynthia Edmund from University of Washington, USA, with a lecture entitled Design Process Expertise, The Importance of Design Awareness. Professor Cynthia Edmund, over to you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the invitation um, to speak here. I had the opportunity to actually visit campus um, pre-pandemic when we could get on a plane and go someplace in the world um, and had a, just an amazing time getting to learn um, about the institution. I was there at the invitation of Dr. Kyria Yosef, um, who founded the Center for Engineering Education um, at UTM, which is a world-renowned um, center that does cutting edge work in, as you all know, in problem-based um, learning and engineering. Um, and also got to know a, a bit about the mechanical engineering school um, with Syed Helmi and, and really learn about, about the, the amazing commitment that you as an institution have to engineering education. So it's lovely to be here again. Um, I have to say it's much easier to walk to my office from the kitchen than it is to fly from Seattle to Singapore, <laughs> um, but I really miss seeing everybody. Um, I am going to share my screen and get going with the talk. Here we go. So um, I've been doing research in design processes for a couple of decades. And what I'm gonna do in the talk today is um, do a brief summary of that work. Um, and I've titled it Design Process Expertise, The Importance of Design Awareness. Um, and I would like to thank Khadija Jordan and Shiva Anem for help with pulling these slides together. As you'll see at the end of the talk, we were bringing in things that happened in class yesterday. So things hot off the press with our current work in design awareness. But first I will um, uh, start with a background introduction of why I am interested in design and then really dive into my couple of decades of work in design process expertise. 
So as we all know, design is a very human endeavor. Um, my favorite quote is from Herb Simon, um, uh, founder of the field of cognitive psychology. Um, and he says about design, everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. So going from state A to state B, solving a problem, satisfying a need, things that we really know about as engineers. Um, but who designs? It's not just engineers. It's architects, it's authors, it's chefs, musicians, poets, uh, all of us when we're deciding what we're going to have for dinner uh, tonight. We do design big and we do design small and engineers for sure do design. My favorite definition of engineering is this really elegantly simple one from Bill Wolf, who is a past president of the National Academy of Engineering here in the US. And engineering is basically, as he calls it, design under constraint. Where, as engineers, we know that the constraints are many. Um, he thinks of engineering really as a creative force. And I think that's something that, that we really need to bring more into engineering and designing what can be in the future, but very critically in engineering constrained by things like nature, <laughs> we, the laws of physics, um, things like human concerns, like in safety and environmental concerns, um, the resource constraints like cost, and then things that he calls like reliability, constructability, maintainability. You can think of so many other things like sustainability, et cetera. And um, when we think about engineering and think about the need to teach our students about design because it's basically how engineering is instantiated, then you go, oh my gosh, how do you teach a, a, a process? It's quite difficult. It's hard to describe processes, it's hard to represent processes, and it's hard to teach processes in comparison to teaching facts. Um, these are some of my favorite artistic renditions of a process. Um, and when we are trying to teach processes in our design classes, um, we have to be as creative as these artists are. My research goal back a couple of decades ago, um, I really decided that I wanted to help engineering students think about the impact of engineering on our societies and on the globe itself. Um, and to consider context and think broadly as they engage in the process of doing engineering and how to actually figure out how, how to teach students about how engineers consider context. Well, what we have to do is look at how engineers engage in design because that's how they instantiate thinking about context. So therefore, my whole research goal has been to deeply study engineering design processes, using those results to enable informed teaching, and then in turn, teaching students then enables greater design awareness in practicing engineers. Thankfully, students respond really well to empirically data-based research findings. So this is a representation of a timeline, which I'll be talking about um, as I get into the details of the research. And this is a student response to learning about design process expertise through timelines. So this student who was a mechanical engineer, after learning about design process expertise with these representations said, super valuable much more compelling to see real data, detail, makes me believe instead of tuning out prescribed information because you can't trust how they derived it because you don't know. Spend another day in our class talking about this research, please. So I love this quote for two reasons. One is because this student is saying, come back to talk about your research and what research prof doesn't like to hear that. Um, but more importantly, it really reinforces how our engineering students really would like to see um, they're teaching based on data. And that's what the whole goal of my research was to do. So that was a brief introduction. Um, and the next section I'm gonna be talking about really the details of the research I've been doing for the past couple of decades. A little bit more detail on the goal. So I said that my goal is to deeply understand engineering design processes to enable informed teaching. Um, but specifically, what I really wanted to do, like we know a lot about how we say we should do design with node and arc models, with arrows and say you should iterate. But what I wanted to do um, sort of in the spirit of cognitive psychology was look at how engineering designers actually do design. 
so we can compare how they actually do design to how we say they should do design. Since my audience is engineers, and I am one, um, as an engineer, and as the student just showed us, engineers tend to be convinced um, with an argument with quantitative data. And so what I was doing was using a qualitative method, uh, verbal protocol analysis, but I decided that I would embark in collecting large sample sizes, much larger than normal for this qualitative method. So I would have enough data so I could do statistical comparisons across my samples. Um, so that, that was my quest several decades ago, um, which uh, had me collect a large corpus of qualitative verbal protocol data of engineers with various levels of expertise, students and practicing professionals. Um, and then I created quantitative measures from the qualitative data so I could do these comparisons. And it was a huge gamble up front. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I hope something shows up and you'll have to let me know if you agree whether something showed up uh, when you see the next slides or not. Probably the most important slide of the whole deck when you see the numbers of the students that we, um, of data that we collected um, is to really say that this um, whole endeavor, this whole research endeavor was done with um, a, a large set of collaborators across several decades. And so wonderful undergraduate and graduate students and research scientists and postdocs and faculty colleagues. And, um, and so this is, I'm representing data that came from this entire set of people who are all wonderful people. So what does my corpus of data look like? Our corpus of data, we have data from 177 individuals who solved design problems, 401 total problems that were solved with about 300 verbal protocols. So that is a massive number um, when you look at verbal protocol studies. The 177 individuals had various levels of expertise, about 150 engineering students, incoming and graduating, about 20 practicing engineering experts, four educators, and then five experts in the domain of the problem that they were solving. Um, this is a massive um, corpus of data. And um, if, you, if you look at it really, you would, people are saying you are totally insane, um, which I might actually agree with them, but I, I, I tend to prefer the term focused. <laughs> um, and hopefully you'll agree that we came up with some interesting results. Um, here's a diagrammatic representation of the 177 individuals. In the column on the left-hand side, you'll see that 92 of the individuals actually designed a playground for a fictitious neighborhood. Um, and that's the, the set of data that I'm gonna be diving into in depth in the next several of slides. The, co the um, column on the right, we had 85 students um, solve three different smaller, shorter problems um, that, um, and they did it actually as incoming first year students and graduating students. So we have some interesting comparison data um, that I'll briefly talk about later in the talk. So I mentioned that um, the data we're talking about come from um, people who solved a playground problem. Um, what they did was designed a playground for a fictitious neighborhood. Um, the problem came as all of our engineering problems do with a set of constraints, including cost and timing and the number of children and how big the lot was and all of those kinds of things. Um, and they had a delivery date that they needed to get to. Um, participants were 26 incoming first year students, 24 graduating engineering students and 19 practicing professionals who were peer identified as expert engineering designers. They all um, participated in a verbal protocol analysis. So individuals had up to three hours to solve the problem in a lab-based setting. They talked aloud, they thought aloud as they spoke aloud as they solved the problem. And then what we did was take the verbal utterances, the tapes, we transcribed them, um, we segmented them into idea units, and then we coded the idea units with um, codes that were developed from um, a design process model. Now here's a slide where we could spend the rest of the talk talking about how do you define design because there are as many definitions of design as there, as there are people listening to this talk. 
I wanted to make sure um, that we had a valid coding scheme for the set of people that we were studying. Um, so what I did was I took engineering design textbooks and to look at how we teach design to our students. And I did a content analysis of seven of those ten, 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 seven of those design textbooks um, and created a set of design activity codes that was sort of the summation and the common elements that we saw across the engineering design books. Um, there was not much variation. Like we, we pretty much know that in engineering, we identify a need, we define the problem, we gather information to understand the problem. We generate ideas of how we could solve the problem. We model our potential solutions. We do feasibility analysis. We evaluate and compare across possible solutions. Um, we make a decision um, and then we communicate. And those two are actually two different codes. I, I accidentally didn't have a carriage return in there. So decision and communication are actually two different codes. And then we implement our, our um, our final design. Um, in this particular set of codes, you notice that identifying a need and implementation are grayed out. And that's because in a lab-based study, we actually had already identified the need and we certainly didn't ask them to go out and build the playground. So we're looking at these, uh, these codes in the middle for um, analyzing the data that we collected. So here's a visual of sort of what it looked like. We had these three samples on the left, left here, first year seniors and experts. They sat in a lab and they talked aloud while they um, solved a problem. And you see up, uh, the, the first, the top um, arrow here. We looked at the solution that they generated and we evaluated the quality of their solution. And this is a super important part of the process because you know, with civil engineers, we care what design process they use while they're designing the bridge, but we actually care more that the bridge stands up. And so we wanted, when I was studying the process, I also wanted to make a link to how process linked to quality. So scoring the quality of a design is a really important aspect. And then the bottom part here is just showing that we took the transcripts, we segmented them into idea units, and then it shows the, the representation that we developed from that whole, you can imagine Excel spreadsheet of, of like what somebody said and what the code it was. You can turn that into a timeline representation um, as we have here. So time goes from left to right and a slash or a block on that on a line means that somebody spent that amount of time in that activity. And so here is a practical example. One of the students said, huh, do you have a list? Do you, do you have a list of materials that would be coded as gathering information and that would be shown on a timeline as a slash on the line for gather? So that's the representation that we'll be using from problem definition, gather, gen, generate, model, feasibility, evaluation, decision, and communication um, with time going from left to right. Okay, so you could imagine we have um, uh, 50 students, 26 incoming, 24 graduating, and we scored the quality. And so we wanted to compare across the student groups. And so the representation that you have here have first year student timelines on the left and graduating student timelines on the right. And you can see the tracing or the timelines or the traces of how they allocated time across activities, they're also split by the top row are representative timelines from students who had low quality products. Um, the middle row are representative timelines from students who had medium artifact qualities, medium solu quality solutions. And the bottom row are representative timelines from students who had high quality solutions. So you can soak in this representation here and start to be able to compare the first year students and the graduating students. And I'd like you to just take a moment and think about what, do you, what are you seeing here? What similarities and differences do you see between the first year and graduating senior students? And do those similarities or differences involve quality scores?
here is where it's really sad that I just walked from the kitchen into my office because I would be with you in a room and I would be saying, what do you see? And um, basically, whenever I give this presentation, people see, see they say things like, here's some quotes, um, the highest quality scores in both groups use a greater range of activities instead of just modeling. Or problem definition is key to the overall project. Or success is strongly correlated with gathering data and defining the problem early on. So you can see in the, in the visual timelines differences in patterns that, that allow people to make those kinds of obser observations, which are all spot on with the statistical results. When I compared the quantitative measures that I could um, develop from this qualitative data, um, the first thing to say is, is Thankfully, the graduating students had higher quality designs. I was, I, I could have published the results regardless, um, but it was really, really great to know that you know the four years and the education did something to move the quality, bump the quality up a little bit. Um, but you could also see that the graduating students had more transitions among design activities, so more bumping around between activities, with some of them with iterations going back. Um, the graduating seniors scoped the problem more effectively by considering more categories of information, which aren't on the timelines here. But you can also see that the graduating students are more likely to get progress sort of further into the process and, and have activities of decision and communication, particularly the high quality graduating senior on the bottom right. When we add the engineering experts um, and also put sort of the, the low quality um, products for an engineering expert, middle quality and high quality, then you can see comparing the engineering experts with the incoming students and the graduating seniors, um, the statistics, you can see that, um, that there is again, sort of a, a higher level of sophistication um, of the processes. And the statistical comparisons show that um, engineering experts spend more time in general. Like you, you can imagine somebody who's an expert knows that you need to spend time to solve the problem and the students don't stay at the mat um, long enough sometimes. And that more time is distributed across all the activities. It's not just uh, more time in only one of the activities. Um, engineering experts gather, uh, scope the problem more effectively by gathering more information and covering more categories. So the problem is scoped more effectively. Um, they spend longer problem scoping before turning to modeling. So spending longer defining the problem and they consider more objects in their design process. Um, they also exhibit what we're calling a cascade pattern of transitions, which is spending time in the upper left and then moving down um, uh, on a diagonal to the bottom right. Um, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. We at CALT live with timelines everywhere. There have been timelines on our walls in whatever space we occupy. So that's a picture on the left. Um, the, the figure on the right here is from a paper I wrote in design studies in November, 2019. If you're interested in, the re in this research, um, this is basically a compilation of all of my research findings um, uh, for this area. And you can see in this figure, teeny tiny, um, but basically as, as people get more experience and more expert designers, their processes look more complex. And we can use the timelines as a canvas to actually present these research results and start to use them as ways to teach our students. Um, for example, um, this you can tell, you can say, okay, it's important to scope a problem before focusing on modeling. And you can present, for example, the high um, quality senior timeline and show ab about how time is spent here with problem definition, gather information and generate ideas before there's much of a focus on modeling. So it's really holding back before running with your first idea, which can be an instinct, um, particularly with incoming 
engineering students. Um, it's important to gather information throughout the process. So when you're modeling an idea, you know, and you go, oh my gosh, I don't know anything. Imagine that. You need to gather more information and generate ideas all the way through the process, not just at the beginning. Transitions across activities are really important. Iterating, going back, the arrows that we see in our node and arc models are important, pivoting from one thing to another. But persistence and staying the course is also really important. So at some point, you can't just keep on defining the problem. You need to choose what to do and actually engage in modeling. So it's important to transition, but it's also important to know when to stop and when to engage in modeling and, and scoping out and, and um, really getting into detail on the project. This is another student um, response to the data where when we gave them a paper and pencil version of what I had you do online, um, or just looking at the screen, uh, one student sketched that cascade shape that I just talked about on top of a timeline and identified it as an ideal project envelope. So that means you really wanna do problem scoping at the beginning, then you need to focus on modeling. And at the end, you really want to be doing decision and communication, but you need to have all these iterations and transitions in amongst. So um, those are um, the, the main results from the playground data. And I'd like to very quickly um, say what, well, it's an interesting question. What story does the rest of the data tell? So I just showed you, um, uh, playground problem, first year students, graduating students, and practicing professionals. But we had other people solving the playground problem and we used other problems. So it was important for me to see if my research results extended past my original institution. So I gathered data from a second institution of undergrad students, first year and graduating seniors, and basically had um, found the same, a similar pattern of results. Looking at domain experts and engineering faculty, actually engineering faculty had the widest variation, smallest number, widest variation. Um, and domain experts, Giovanna Scaloni um, uh, led a study where we looked at our domain experts and compared them to engineering experts and how um, people are able to deal with ambiguity and really found that understanding the domain, and in this case, it was playground design, um, those experts were actually even able to explore context and handle ambiguity um, even more than the engineering design experts. We had students solving, as I said, other problems. So these are a ping pong ball launcher and a street crossing system in a longitudinal within subject study um, where we had uh, 32 first year and 61 graduating students. Um, we showed the same pattern of, of really much more sophisticated design processes for the graduating seniors. And we have a study with the team at, at uh, initial part of, a, of designing a digital pen where we started to see um, the cascade pattern show up. So to summarize, if we want individuals to move towards expert design behaviors, the data from our studies show that what you want people to do, what you want designers to do is a thorough problem scoping at the start of the process, gather information throughout, make sure to transition and iterate and allocate time in a vaguely um, uh, form to match a cascade pattern through design activities that you could also call an ideal project envelope. And I forgot to run my own timer, so hopefully my timing is going okay. Um, uh, so many people uh, talk to us about um, the timelines looking like music that I worked with a student one time who actually sonified the timelines. And you can go listen to um, tones and bells from the timelines from a, a website that we have called Celt Soundtracks. And so you can explore that on your own. And I'll briefly play two soundtracks from two of the timelines. So here I'd like to play the representative timeline from the incoming student who, um, who had a middle quality design. And this is the kind of canonical incoming student who reads the problem, maybe reads it again, um, comes up with one idea and then just models the heck out of it. Whoops. 
Nope, wrong. There we go. So you, you, that is the sound of average design. <laughs> it looks monotonic and it sounds monotonic. Um, in comparison, uh, if you look at the high quality graduating senior design process, this is what it sounds like. So you really can have um, a broad set of tones that really mirrors spending time across a, a lot of activities. Um, the last concept I want to talk about related to the data is um, using the timelines as a canvas to think of something that I'm calling, we're calling design signatures. So each timeline is like a tracing of design activities over time. You've done a design project and behind you, you've left the tracing of how you spent your time. And each instance of a timeline of a design process leaves a unique design signature. And you can think of signatures that can vary according to function. So on the left here is a sig my signature for a student recommendation letter where I want people to know that this came from me and so I'm careful with my signature. And on the right here is my signature buying a cup of coffee like a long time ago. I haven't bought a cup of coffee for a long time. There's this great coffee shop. Uh, in Johar Baru, Kyria, 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 uh, in a container down by the water there. Um, spent a lot of time watching the rain. Anyway, um, when I would buy a cup of coffee there, uh, this is what my signature would look like. And you can think about design signatures in these timelines as a tool. So when before you engage in a design process or a design project, choose a design signature up front and then use it as a guide to monitor your process. So students engaging in their capstone design projects would really wanna look like graduating senior with the high quality, looking, allocating time across all kinds of activities, doing a lot of problem scoping. But a student in an afternoon hackathon doesn't have that luxury. So a student in an afternoon hackathon would intentionally choose to be like the medium quality um, incoming first year student because you don't have time to actually have a big, huge problem scoping. So it's just using the concept of these design timelines as signatures thinking ahead. You can also think of your signature. So that the amazing gymnast Simone Biles has a signature balance beam move that is just, she always does it and it's, it's named after her. And then you can think about you or your students. If you have a typical way you engage in design or you want to engage in design, the question is, do you have an ideal design signature? Do you have something you aspire to as you allocate time across the activities? And we'll revisit this concept when we discuss design awareness. I wanna look at my watch here. Okay, I think that we're doing okay. So the research summary is we have a large corpus of data um, to develop descriptive design models. And then we have these timeline representations that turn the data into really visual representations that can represent the statistical findings that we, um, that we ran across the large corpus of data. So now I'm pivoting to teaching design. And this is my design dilemma. <laughs> so now what? Large corpus of data. Pretty interesting findings, at least I think so. How do you translate those research findings into practice in an engineering classroom? So that's my design challenge. How can we find these, uh, how, how can these findings be useful for, for you teaching design, for us teaching design? Teaching design, huge landscape, right? Capstone design, first year design. Some places have a design spine. There's disciplinary design. There's maker spaces. There's service learning. So many different ways and places that we teach design. And this is how we usually teach design. We usually have these node and arc representations where like those activities that we talked about, again, this is looking familiar. Here's the, our human-centered design and engineering design process model we use a lot in our department. Here's a model that has been used in the Stanford D School. Um, uh, familiar things, research, ideate, prototype, evaluate, produce. Empathy, define, ideate, prototype, test. 
And then the arrows, of course, because you always tell your students, you need to iterate. Here's what you need to do, but you need to iterate. In come the timelines. What are the affordances of the timelines? Well, they end up being pretty concrete and sticky. You can see on the right here, um, there's two um, node and arc representations, a linear and a circular one of the design activity codes that we used in our research, and then a timeline that shows one passage through. So a timeline, the affordances are that it shows a specific instance. It shows one way that somebody allocated time through these node and arc models. Time is explicit, so it makes it really concrete. Abstract concepts are made visible. It's grounded in data, like that student said at the beginning, I wanna see something grounded in data, not these um, uh, prescribed things. Um, there are things that people can identify with personally, and all this makes them really concrete and sticky, and things that you that are, are useful to add to these node and arc models. I would never take away the node and arc models because those are abstract representations across all design, but these concrete timelines are quite useful to add in addition um, to really help flesh out the concepts for students. Um, these Here's just making the abstract concepts made visible. If you compare, you tell somebody, you need to iterate what that looks like in a node and arc model is the arrow back. So you say to the students, do this model, but remember to do a lot of arrows. In a timeline, it's really concrete. You can see the back and forth. Um, you, so you can see the pivots or the transitions. You can also in a timeline see that it's you got to persist. You know, you need to tell students, okay, you can't just spend forever coming up with ideas. You got to choose one. Um, and in the node and arc model, that's like stay in your box, stay in your lane. But in the timeline, you can see time allocated. And so that's really helpful. It resonates with students. Here's a civil engineering student um, presented with this data says, yeah, realizing that taking your time is important, realizing that higher quality designs gather data and define the problem more thoroughly before modeling, which is so cool to see as statistically re relevant, because now I can prove to people that understanding the problem first is crucial for success. And these are the students actually doing the capitals here. Um, so you could just imagine this is the student who's in the, in the team going, no, we can't do the first thing that comes to our mind. We have to think broadly. We have to actually um, understand the problem first um, and just have data and representations to show that is really useful. So some examples of using the timelines in the classroom is inspiration. I'll go through a few here before we turn to design awareness. Um, I've given many presentations like I'm giving here with these data. You can imagine doing this in a classroom, students working individually, students working in teams, students in their capstone teams that are already formed, wrestling with what this design looks like so they can connect it to their own designs. Um, here's an activity. So a colleague in Toronto, some colleagues in Toronto took my timelines and they used the timelines as a coding activity for design sprints. Um, as sort of a fishbowl activity. So I, I took that back from them and I've been doing that with the paper um, uh, coding schemes. They just do the lecture and then do a, do a design challenge and one person does user research to watch. Um, so I've been doing the paper and pencil for years. We all pivoted to online. And so Shiva Anam actually developed this Google form where in a Zoom breakout, students did a design challenge and one student watched what was going on and oh my gosh, look, <laughs> and then they sketched the ideal project envelope on top of the Google form. That's like music to a teacher's eyes. Um, here we have, um, sometimes I have students, I have um, little cards and I have them do a card sorting task, which ones are experts and which ones are not. And again, pivoting to online, Khadija Jordan made this um, online version and here's a one group sorting of the, of the timelines, what they thought went in the nine different boxes. And so we've taken some of our activities and in the pivot to the online world, made them online as well. My colleague Jan Janet McDonald in uh, Central St. Martin's um, School of Design in London, um, 
uh, took the timelines as an inspiration of a couple of design briefs where in the first brief she had students re-represent um, the original data um, and they came up with amazing representations. And then she had them solve a design problem and represent their own design processes. And the creativity of both her students in Central St. Martins and our engineering students at the University of Washington really blew me away and really set the stage for us turning um, towards the concept of design awareness, which is where we're heading next, which is our current work and um, that I'm engaging with a set of uh, amazing students. Um, and that is on the concept of design awareness. So when we think about teaching our students about design, it's not just in the classroom, but what they're gonna do in the future when they graduate. And when you're doing design in the future, it's not enough to know about expert design behavior. You need to enact expert design behavior. And how do you get someone to enact it in the future? Um, we are trying to figure out how to make people pay attention in the present. And so we we're talking about this concept we're calling design awareness, where someone who has keen design awareness is able to understand the design process in general, stay aware of where they are in the process when they engage in a design project, engage in reflection and action, the concept from Donald Schoen, to assess what they need to do next, make informed choices for next steps, enact those choices, and then continue the cycle. A designer who demonstrates design awareness can intentionally move towards those expert design behaviors that I talked about earlier in the, in, the, in the talk today. A designer who demonstrates design awareness can answer their own design awareness questions. And I'll talk about a couple of classes that we've run where students generate their own design questions. After working with us, their questions are pretty great. Like, how iterative is my design process? Or can I, can I expect how much iteration I'm going to make according to what I'm designing? Which is like a, yet another level of detail. Or, um, What's the average time I spend on a specific activity code before switching to a different one in general? Or I love the second way to state it when another student says, how often do I jump into design phases randomly or out of frustration? <laughs> so you can, uh, as somebody who is aware of what they're doing to, in design can start to drill down on specific ways that they interact with design processes. A designer who demonstrates design awareness also can think metacognitively about their design processes. So metacognition is, uh, is basically thinking about thinking. And one common way to think about metacognition is people planning, monitoring, and evaluating what they're doing. And so in this case, planning what you're going to do in a design project, um, monitoring how you're doing it, that reflection in action, evaluating how you're doing and then changing what you're going to do. And so um, you can think about that in a specific while you're in a project, but you can also think about it across projects and learning uh, uh, going across projects. So you can think of metacognition at two different levels. How to develop design awareness in students. We've designed two different immersive experiences to promote metacognition and design awareness where we have students do design, represent design, and reflect on those representations. There's two versions. One where is Dear Data. Um, one is Dear Design, and it's based on Dear Data's creation of postcards. And another is a design awareness app creation of timelines. So the first one I'll briefly go over is um, we're calling it Dear Design, and it's based on this amazing book um, by Lupi and Pasevec on Dear Data, two um, designers who sent postcards to each other representing different data that they would collect. And we thought, wow, why don't we actually do that with different design processes people enact? So over a 10 week quarter, students did design. So they designed websites, they worked on their class projects, they designed portfolios, they designed cakes and meals and apps. And each week when they did design, they would represent their process on a postcard. So they would draw their design. 
Um, they learned how to capture design and er interpretation methods and explore different models, explore different design expertise research. And importantly, they discussed and reflected on that and, um, uh, and, and about their personal design processes with their class members. And this is something that I ran with um, Catherine Schroyer and Khadija across this last year. We started it winter quarter um, before the pandemic. So the first one we started was in, in, pro, in person and then the last two quarters we've done it online. And um, recalling the concept of design signatures, having students represent their ideal design signature was the final assignment. So they, we wanted them to project themselves um, into the future and how they wanted to typically engage in design. So we had them as their final project design their own ideal design signature representation. And so this is Jordan Yunbuck's uh, series of postcards across the, across the 10 weeks. There were eight in, uh, instances of him doing design and then representing his design on a postcard. You can see these just amazing representations. And then his ideal design signature is the one on the bottom row here. So you can see it's this beautiful representation of different activities in a flow of, uh, of an ideal design signature. So that is an immersive experience in Dear Design Postcards. And then these are um, representations of four students' final ideal design signatures. Um, and you can see the, the thought that went into them, the creativity, the, the detailed knowledge of different aspects of design that would have each of these students actually develop this represent these representations. It just blew us away, um, just amazing. So that was immersive experience one. Immersive experience two um, is where I've been working with a team of students who created, where's my phone, a design awareness app. So um, we wanted to have an interactive method for designers to record their steps and of in their design process in real time. So what am I doing exactly right now? Um, and so over the 10 weeks, the students, like the last one, did design and did the same kinds of design, websites, class projects, designing a meal. But they recorded it in the design awareness app that we wrote, and the app created timeline representations. So the activities for these students included user testing, and co-design on app features, but then the other same stuff that the previous students did, exploring different models, learning about design expertise research, um, connecting with each other, each class and learning from each other's representations, and then an ideal design signature as a final assignment. And so I did that with, um, I have been working on that with, with um, Shiva and Khadija I, I already mentioned, and then Nicole Washington, um, Grace Barrar, Riley Sweem, and Jordan Yunbuck. And we have, we have this tight working group and we're developing this app and the concept and it's just amazing. Um, and talk about amazing. Last night was our last session with these students over a quarter. And this is Edgar Lopez's um, six of his timelines when he engaged in various kinds of design projects. These are the timelines that were created from the app that we wrote. Um, and in the middle and the bottom here is his ideal design signature going forward. So you can see the complexity here where different activities are different colors, but they one leads into the other because design is a wave as he was talking about it that keeps on going forward. And then you can see as these two waves come together, it's actually the ideal project envelope. So you can see the cascade. And so the level of sophistication of his representation here is just amazing. And the elegant simplicity with which he was able to convey it, just like all of the students just blew us away. So here, like I said, last night, we just saw what students who used our app for 10 weeks came up with. And these are um, five other students representations of how they're planning to do design in the future. So we are so excited about this work um, and what engineering students can do when they think deeply about design. So to wrap up, um, and hopefully I'm doing okay on timing here, um, to briefly wrap up, uh, 
and summarize, it's really hard to describe, represent, and teach a process. It's really hard to teach design processes, and we have been doing it in engineering for a very long time. Today, I presented a body of work um, that is empirically um, describing the complexity of design processes, looking at various aspects like design um, expertise and um, representing that empirical data with representations of design signatures, also presenting statistical um, results so I could compare ran, running large enough sample sizes to compare students across the samples I collected. And then some example teaching activities that end up being very concrete and sticky for students. Um, we are planning to compile our activities um, together and put them in a website so people can access our, our teaching activities um, in their classrooms. And so if you're interested in, um, in, in getting that when we have it together, send me an email and then we, I can send you an email once we have something that we are able to share. And again, um, the, um, uh, you can look at the recent design studies paper um, uh, for a lot of the details of the research and my faculty page in human centered design and engineering have some other talks that I've given about these same, um, these same data. Um, so um, what I, I wanted to show here as I'm coming to the end is just to say um, the work that our students are doing when we deeply engage with them about what design can look like and we talk about design awareness and and get students to explore in depth through making representations themselves or through this app um, making timelines it's the act of deeply connecting with themselves personally and how they do design and making the representations that enable the students to um, be incredibly nuanced and able to describe design. Um, they're able to be nimble. These students are going to be our future engineers. These are going to be the ones who we look at the problems we're leaving to our future engineers. Look at the problems they're going to have to solve. And it's students who are able to represent design like this as will be nimble problem solvers. Um, connecting back to my whole reason to do my research career, teaching engineers to think broadly and consider context. It's students who are able to think of themselves as future designers with these kinds of representations who will be able to absolutely do that, who will be thinking broadly, who will be thinking about all kinds of stakeholders, who will be coming up with ideas that we aren't, we don't have yet. And so, um, it's, it's really fantastic to be able to contribute to helping our future engineers solve the big problems that we're leaving with them. And I also wanted to say if that once you are captivated by timelines, you will see them everywhere. <laughs> and this up in the upper right-hand corner is a time, uh, the three first year students that I, I painted as a batik when I was visiting you several years ago. And you may not be surprised to hear but I have been taking pictures of birds on wires for decades. And literally a couple of months ago, I finally found a set of birds who were sitting on uh, telephone wires in the configuration of an ideal project envelope. So I wanted to leave that with you as an inspiration as we also listen to the complexity of design. Okay, so I am going to stop sharing and hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I'm here back again. Oh my God, Cindy, Cindy, this is, this is a very, very amazing, uh, complex, uh, very detailed. How, how, how long did you study this? Um, I, well, so I got my PhD in 1990 um, and I'm going to, are, can you see my slides? It looks to me like I'm still sharing the slides, but I, I can. No, no, no. It's, just, it's just both of us, you and me. Okay, so I, I see the slides, but that's okay. Um, okay. I will pretend that it's just you and me. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, yes, yes. I, I have been, I graduated, I got my PhD from engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon in 1990. 
Uh -huh. um, and um, um, I started to do this work in 1992. So it has it has literally taken decades. I'm sorry, Cindy. I think you need to uh, to stop sharing. So is it okay? Yeah, uh, I did. Yeah. All right. Go yeah, I think it's okay. you need to do. Yeah, I, okay, I think no, that no. I stopped sharing, but yeah. Okay. All right. Continue. So meaning that's like uh, 30 years. Uh, sorry. It's almost 30 years, the study? Yeah. My God. <laughs> but then I can see the complexity, the, the right. hard work. No wonder you have a long list of names there listed. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, like I'm I said, I, I, prefer, I, I like to use the term focused. Um, some people might say stubborn. Um, you know, some people might say a little bit crazy, <laughs> but um, uh, stick, sticking with it for that long, um, the, the initial playground data, the findings from the initial playground study took about 10 years to collect oh, all no. the data and do all of the analyses and all of the statistical comparisons. So um, that was the, 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 the upfront um, effort was, was 10 or 15 years. And then it's been building on that um, for the teaching part since then. That's very amazing. So very mind blown. I I I didn't expect to see something like this uh, from your presentation. And no wonder. Okay, let me just repeat the title of your presentation: Design Process Expertise: The Importance of Design Awareness. So, I I believe if uh, to do to the audiences here, if uh, if you uh, I think you need to repeat watching this uh, video. Okay, I am going to repeat two or three times more, maybe more than that, because uh, there are so many important points that need to be captured. So I scribble in all my paper here. So there's many things. Uh, I, I'm wondering if there's any questions. If no, because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, okay, I think there's one question here. Okay, this comes from Amir Putra. Dear Prof. Evan. Thanks for this sharing. It's really amazing, just like what I said just now. May I know, is the design process that you have mentioned is similar with uh, Puch design, design process? process. Okay, yeah. okay so I, I maybe uh, pronounce it wrongly. If different, which one is the best to be used for engineer? Yeah, that's a good question, Amir. Um, I remember looking at the Pew design process at one point, and um, I, I, I would say um, that um, different design process models are useful in different situations. There's a fabulous compendium of design models that Hugh Dubberly put together that has about 100 different models. So one of the activities that we have our students to do is look across these 100 ways of representing design. They're all really useful. There's diverge converge models, there's cyclical models, there are you know really in-depth um, software models. And so my recollection is that the Pew design process is a is a really fine. And um, and if it works for you, then totally use it. Um, but I think one of the things that's really useful is for our students to know there is no one way of thinking about design. And so it's it, you don't want people to say this is the only way to think about design because then they then they get too narrow. And you could see with what our students are doing, we want people to have a broad understanding of design. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, we just we just want people to have uh, flexibility, broad yeah. mind. Okay? All right, that's fantastic. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, is there any quest, any more question? Let me just see. Mm, if not yet, then I have one question. I have actually listed a lot of questions I, and I'm definitely going to contact you soon. Okay, but the question that I want to ask he, to you now is uh, when you do the the playground, uh, playground design, mm -hmm. okay, so you, uh, you have the undergraduate, also the past postgraduate. So when you 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 have the undergraduate and postgraduate, were they working individually or yes. in a team? No, they were working individually. Okay. Um, yeah, we yeah, really good that you that you picked up on that because this is these are individuals doing design, and you know we we of course in engineering we work in teams. So I did have one experience where I, I looked at teams. Um, but these data are individual. 
Um, and they're valid because it's individuals who make up teams, <laughs> you know, and, you know, you, you have to actually have everybody working together to, to do the whole design space. But um, yes, good catch that it is in data from individuals, most of my data. Okay, if this is from individual data, yeah. how how actually did you actually record this? So meaning when they are doing the design, when they yeah. were doing the design, they yeah. have to mention that they are doing this and that, and then you can capture the record, the audio record. Yeah. Was so what you can do in a verbal protocol study, um, we had we had people, we had audio tapes and and video tapes, and okay. the instructions are to have them think aloud. Um, while they are engaging in design. So um, you're, you know, you're like, okay, I'm like, what am I going to have for dinner? Okay, what is in my refrigerator? And do I feel like cooking or do I not feel like cooking? And so you basically um, um, do, you, you, they're thinking aloud. So they're, they're talking about what's going through their mind. And there's all kinds of like all data has problems, right? So what you're hearing is what people choose to say. And then you, you can also actually um, look at what they're sketching as well. So you can you can add some, um, uh, some other data to it. Okay, so it's very important that uh, when you were performing this study, you ask them, okay, it's a requirement for them to think aloud. So yes. when they are thinking and when they are doing, they need to mention, they need to verbally express it, yes. correct? Yes. And then yes. you have the audio recorded and also video yes. recorded so you can yes. uh, verify their actions. All right, right. okay, now right. I understand a little bit. Yes. So I uh, have, okay, we have another question there from Fasiha Yusuf. Okay, I, I reserve my questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, do you have any comment or opinion on empathic design? Yeah, so um, empathy, I think, it, so I, there are a lot of different models that have empathy as part of the design process. And um, I, I'm in a human-centered design and engineering um, department. So um, we think about empathy as actually a really critical and critically important part of the design process. And so um, if, if that's what you're asking about, what role does empathy have in the design process? I think it's really important. Um, because you as an engineer aren't designing something for you, you're designing something for somebody else to use, uh, somebody else to build. And, and in human-centered design and engineering, really knowing about who your users are and not just users, all kinds of stakeholders in the system, you know, the people who are doing the mining for whatever materials are in whatever you're, you're creating. It's super important to for the concept of empathy um, so that you're not optimizing yourself so that you're really, this is completely linked to my whole goal for my whole research program on understanding context and thinking broadly. So having empathy for other individuals and having empathy for our globe, having empathy for our environment and our ecological systems is really, really key. So great question. Okay. Uh, okay, we have another question. Okay, this comes from uh, Dr. Sharifah Kamila Said Yusof. Prof. Cynthia, do you do you do do uh, do you assess do your assessment the same with do you assessment yeah, the, same, right. the same first group, group, group um, students during yeah. the senior year? If yes, what's your finding in their design abilities? Um, so, so the, so in the design, um, so the method that I used, the samples that I used in the playground data I presented was in a cross subject design. So at the same time, I collected data from the incoming first year students and the graduating senior students. So in my playground data, um, all the data are cross subjects in, um, the other, however, in the other, um, uh, problems that I studied, the ping pong ball launching and street crossing and Midwest floods retaining wall design, um, I ended up, um, I did a first year study, I think it was for pre and post one semester, um, but I had, thankfully, I had great funding from the National Science Foundation and I still had funding when those students graduated. So I, it was five years of funding. So I found um, some of the original students from first year, and I had them do the same tasks for graduating, 
And then, so I have a within subjects longitudinal study. And one of the slides I showed you actually were data from within subjects longitudinal. Um, and then I also collected data from other students um, who were graduating seniors so I could see if there was a pretest effect. So um, super great methodological question. Um, some of my data, most of my data are across subjects, but some of my data are within subject longitudinal. Okay, amazing. So I hope, uh, okay, here's a question from uh, Prof. Kairia. Okay, uh, hi Cindy, great to hear about your latest work on design awareness. How do you capture the problem in the app? Do the users state how long they were identifying or scoping the problem, ETC? Yeah, no, so um, what we do is we actually have the picture that you saw, I'm going to see if I can show you. Um, um, I'm going to create a project. Okay. Um, we have students, uh, that's not going to work. Um, <laughs> we have predetermined coding schemes. And so students actually hit an on button to say when they start generating ideas, they click the generate idea button. And then when they start modeling, they turn off generate and they turn on modeling. So they are literally entering into the app the code that they that they are working on at that time okay. um and and so it's real-time data collection um and so it's in the moment it's short shorter term projects and we're looking at ways to actually uh, let people collect data and input it so that they can do like longer term things like a capstone project or something like that so it's super it's super exciting and then those timelines that you saw weren't me taking 10 years to analyze. <laughs> it was students putting in their own activities and the software generates the timelines. Like you don't need 10 or 15 years. Oh, okay, okay. All right. By the way, is the app available for uh, download? <laughs> uh oh, Khadija, Shiva, what am I supposed to say here? It's not available yet. Um, okay. We are, that's one of the things that we want to make available. We have to figure out, you know, remember those illities that, that Bill Wolf talked about, sustainability, maintainability, you know, these students graduate, you know, we want them to graduate and then they do, and then it's just me. So we have to figure out, <laughs> yes is going to be hopefully the answer sometime soon. It, not quite yet. Okay, okay. All right, while we, okay, we have another question, okay, from Fasi Hayusov. I have another question, uh, Prof. Okay, some research findings suggest that first-year students are more creative compared yeah. to final year students. It is pro probably because the more they learn, the more they have restriction in their mind. How do you relate this to your result just now? Or are creativity and design quality a different thing to dis to discuss? Wow. Okay, that, that's a question that would require us to go to that coffee shop in the container down by the water. <laughs> in Jehovah uh, There is a lot of concepts in this question and it's a really nuanced question and it's a good one. Um, you know, I think one of the things is some research findings, um, if they aren't longitudinal, um, you know, we, in the US, we, um, accept people into engineering depending on how, on their good grades in math and science. So we're already screening out creative people <laughs> if, they, if they just didn't happen to take the right math classes starting in middle school. Um, and then when they get to our campus, um, we have them take math and science for the first two years before they can do the creative design stuff as an engineer. So we are like screening out the creative people. So it's possible it has nothing to do, you know, that we're, that we're, the people who are creative are just leaving because they're like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to stick around. Um, so that's one possibility. Um, and creativity and design quality um in our design in our design our quality uh, this is going to take a long time to answer so the quality measures in the playground problem um included um creativity uh and so it really depends on how you uh, you're completely right um it depends on how you actually define design quality um and and then who who do we let into engineering and then 
how are we educating them? Yeah. Okay, I hope that answers. <laughs> uh, but it's quite interesting to know uh, the 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 you know, the actual feedback for for the creativity part from first year and the final year students. So it's it's interesting. But then uh, you have given your dimension, which is partly yeah, that's that's true. Okay, while waiting for other question, I have another question. Okay, uh, when referring to your, you know, that one, the playground uh, design that you have just now for, for the poor design, moderate design, and also very good design. So you come up with the ideal project envelope. Okay, and then I found it quite tricky, uh, quite complex to actually map that envelope. So uh -huh. is there any, any method? Because you can see, still see some patterns here and there, yeah. but then right. what actually make you decide to design or maybe to, to, to neglect some of the points? I hope yeah. you understand my question. Yeah, yeah. So I, I call that, um, so my, my friend in mechanical engineering, Sherry Shepard, calls things, does a squint analysis. So Ooh. I would call, you know, looking at that last timeline, the student who sketched on top of it was doing a squint analysis and just seeing the, the major trend. And so I would say, don't worry about the ones falling outside, you know, because you'd want to be doing all kinds of activities. You just, when you're squinting, you just want to make sure that at the beginning of the problem, you're understanding the problem. In the middle, you want to focus on modeling. And towards the end, you need to communicate the whole time, but towards the end is when you're you're really focusing on decision and communication and those kinds of things. So, so good catch. Yes, there were for sure things outside that envelope and we're not actually intending to say you need to follow this cascade because that's as bad as say doing a linear model, you know, do this, then this, then this. And we really want people to be flexible and, and do all kinds of transitions and that kind of stuff. Okay, fantastic. Uh, that question will follow up with another question. Okay, uh, sorry, that last question. <laughs> I, have been, I have been warned. Okay, okay. Uh, when, uh, okay, because you already have that uh, ideal project envelope, um, would there be any study in terms of statistical analysis uh, to actually uh, quantify the, 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 the envelope? Ah, I'll leave that for someone else to do. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, that's it for today and for your side for this evening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cindy, for a very, very splendid, amazing uh, sharing. So I, I, I learned a lot, and I, I, I promise you, I'm going to watch this maybe two, three times more, and then I'm <laughs> going to get back to you. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot to to uh, to Prof. Cindy again, and then uh, for your 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 colleague behind it. I mean, your your your, your staff, your your student, uh, well, Hadija and also Jaya. And Shiva, yeah. And Shiva, sorry, Shiva. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so I hope we can stay in touch and then uh, hope the relationship between uh, your site and also Center for yeah, yeah. CEE, okay, so uh, will we'll remain intact. Okay, so yes. hope, hope okay. to see you pretty soon and then to have another coffee version. Yes, yes. In, in <laughs> Chaiwala, Chaiwala <laughs> Company Container Cafe or something like that. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, till then, thank you very much. I'll see you, bye. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, over to you, Dr. Rafiq. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. thank you, Zaki, for uh, moderating the session and a special yeah, sorry, that, I got excited. our distinguished guest, uh, Cindy Edmund. Thank you so much for a great sharing, sharing session. And uh, to all of our viewers uh, out there watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, Thank you very much for watching. Do stay tuned. We have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.